is um, November through March, you know, kind of that winter, more of the winter season, and then April to May, and then I'll have June, and then July and August together, and September and October. It's kind of how I'm going to go through it. Feel free to ask any questions along the way. You know, I kind of have it lined up through the seasons, but sometimes when you start talking about something, let's say bison, you know, it, it's hard just to talk about a, you know, a specific area of bison just during the winter time. So things might bounce around a little bit, or I might repeat myself, you know, with some of the different things as, as I go through Yellowstone, but just kind of start with the map. You know, you have two loops in the park, um, kind of a figure eight. So you have the Northern loop, um, and everybody, I'm going to use my mouse some. Can you kind of see where that mouse is on there? So I'm going to circle that, you know, the upper loop. You have the lower loop of Yellowstone. So down here on the, the west side of the park, you have Old Faithful. On the, the east side over here, this is uh, Hayden Valley. A um, couple places I'll talk about. You know, you have the Gibbon River right through here. You have the Firehole River down here. Again, back over to the east side through Hayden Valley, you have the Yellowstone River going down into Yellowstone Lake. And going up north, um, so you have Lamar Valley kind of on this northeast side of the park. Uh, you have the Tower Junction, um, Swan Lake Flats here, Mammoth Hot Springs. So just kind of a few areas in Yellowstone, I guess I should mention here, you know, the Madison River, West Yellowstone, the Madison. So I'll be referring to some of these areas. If any time I mention a place and you don't know where it's at, feel free to ask and uh, I will, I'll bring that back up and share it with you. Yes. Okay, there we go. So Yellowstone through the seasons here. So starting with... Okay, starting with uh, November through March. And there's, you know, there's, this is a long period. There's a lot going on. Most of what I'm going to be sharing is going to come through the interior of the park. Uh, I guide snow coaches for a different company in the, the winter time. And so I spend most of my time in uh, the interior, but I'll mention, you know, some things from Grand Teton, you know, some things from uh, the Northern side of Yellowstone as well. So bighorn sheep. November, uh, the bighorn sheep go into the rut. And so they're, you know, as far as it, the year goes, they're the, one of the very last ones. And the rut, that's their mating season. Uh, with the bighorn in particular, you're going to have um, animals, you know, the, the, the rams going head to head with each other. It speeds up to 35 miles per hour. And they have a double plated skull that allows that to impact to happen. And during this time of year, you know, for a bighorn sheep down at uh, in Grand Teton, um, out on the Elk Refuge is a great place to see them. And in Yellowstone on the Northern Range, so anywhere from Gardner out through Lamar Valley, uh, this time of year they're dropping down in elevation. So if you were to drive the back roads outside of Gardner, you'd probably find bighorn sheep. Uh, you probably see them around um, the Yellowstone River Bridge, the Yellowstone Picnic Area. And then as far out as um, the confluence of the Lamar and Slough Creek. And that's, you know, the, probably the best time of year to see bighorn sheep. You'll see them other times in the year, a lot of times throughout the year. Well, I'll get more into that a little bit later. But most of the time, especially the rams, are they're going to be up higher. Um, I have a few foxes here. I think wintertime is going to be the best time to see foxes. Uh, in the interior, it's typically Hayden Valley. You know, typically we think of some of these animals as nocturnal or crepuscular. Crepuscular just being that they're active usually at dawn and dusk. But in the wintertime, a lot of these animals get active during the daytime when uh, the temperature is the warmest. And, they're, and so foxes we will see quite often um, in Hayden Valley. Other places going to the north side of the park, I know Pebble Creek. And it used to be around that, again, that Yellowstone picnic area. The Yellowstone River Bridge was a good place to see foxes as well. Uh, and sometimes the pictures in here, it, you know, it's like they're pretty pictures. So I might have added some and other pictures are, you know, there's a story behind it or something I want to share about, about that. For example, this here, 
So one of the things that draws a lot of people to look for and want to see foxes in the wintertime is they're hunting. And so when I'm, when I'm watching foxes in the wintertime, I'm watching for this right here. You notice that head and it's kind of tilted some. And so what that, that fox is doing is it's triangulating where the mouse is, where the rodent is, whatever it's hunting underneath the snow. And so it's going to tilt that head back and forth and trying to pinpoint where whatever target it is, is at. And then that's when it's going to jump up and go for it. And this is one of those things that, you know, people love to see. And it's a lot of times, you know, I have people on my tours are like, oh, you know, it's like National Geographic out there. And this is just an opportunity to be able to watch how high up these foxes go and how far into the snow they get to go for their prey. And so the foxes, that's their primary diet out there is some type of rodent. Usually I think it happens to be voles and Yellowstone that's underneath the snow that they're going through. Uh, coyotes do the same type of thing. You know, coyotes become a lot more active in the winter for the same type of reason. Um, you can see them throughout the summer, throughout the year. But when I go into Yellowstone and, you know, on a tour in the wintertime, I tell people kind of the four, four things that we're going to be looking for on a regular basis. That's going to be coyotes, bison, uh, trumpeter swans, different waterfowl, and bald eagles. And I think there was only one day this winter. And, you know, uh, actually, I, sh I should back up real quick. I, something I didn't mention. I mentioned the winter season. So the park closes to most car travel, uh, first of November. And December 15th is what I refer to as the winter season. So December 15th is when it opens for snow coaches. And that goes through March 15th, where it closes down. And so the winter season in Yellowstone for me is that December 15th to March 15th. So during that time, I think there was only one day that we didn't see a coyote um, while I was about in Yellowstone. And so they're going to be doing the same thing as the foxes. They will be hunting rodents. But the other thing is they're um, a little bit more versatile. So we'll see them, um, you know, going after the rodents, the voles and things. But they're also eyeing different things along the rivers. So they spend a lot of time along the river, especially the Madison River, which is this river here, because the water is open through the winter. And that's the same with the Madison, the, the Gibbon, and the Firehole Rivers. And so in this case, this coyote, you know, what it's, what it's doing is it's looking for an opportunity. It's opportunistic. It sees the swans, thinks, you know, do they see me? Should I go for this? And in this case, it decided it wasn't worth it. And, you know, something with all the animals that, as I, I mentioned about them and their diets and things and their movements, it's all, you know, this question of what's my reward and what's the risk that I put into it? You know, this coyote is going to go out there. It's going to go for something that a swan, that's a big meal. They can take those. We see it every year, but that's a big, you know, that's a fight for them those wings and then it's getting wet you know struggle to get that back out of the water drag it up in the snow so you know i guess instinctively these animals know you know what am i doing is this is this going to be worth it for me so we'll see them go after um swans geese ducks along the river um they'll go after rodents and a couple of years ago, we actually had some coyotes that um, were fishing, which is not uh, a natural behavior. It was something they learned. BBC came out and, and filmed that. Uh, the last couple of years, we have not had those coyotes doing that, but for a while. So, you know, it's adaptation it's to, to live. Um, you know, this is not only a nice comparison of a coyote with the bison. Often people ask, oh, you know, is that coyote gonna go get the bison you know this coyote is like 35 pounds and so this is not you know these bison are not on their menu but you'll notice this area around all of the bison is trampled down and so the coyotes and the foxes and things like this area because it provides an easier access to for hunting for them for the rodents it's easier to walk through those areas and trying to go through deep snow um so with this here, I want to point out, so 
something I see a lot with coyotes in Yellowstone in the winter time is this nice big fur coat they have. And so oftentimes people see this and, you know, if you're in Florida or somewhere in the South or something, the coyotes aren't going to look this good. They're going to be a little bit more mangy looking or not have this fur coat. So people see that and they think it's a wolf. And I've seen that a lot. And, you know, a couple of things, when I talk to people about coyotes and wolves, what I'm saying is one, you know, take a look at the bushy tail, you know, watch for that bushy tail and pointy, pointy nostrils, pointy face that comes out more. These, you know, they're a little windblown ears, but they're a pointier ear as well. So a coyote, 35 pounds about think of something around the size of a, a blue healer or a border collie um, as far as kind of a size comparison you know you compare that oh and uh, I should mention this something else that happens in the winter time um, for kind of all the dogs the foxes the wolves and the coyotes is it's an easy day to remember February 14th Valentine's Day kind of say is their peak mating season and so we get activity and these two don't look like they're very in love um they were paired up and they were happy until one of them pulled a swan out of the yellowstone river and i think there was some competition there then um let me get there i'm trying to think coyotes I'll, i'm going to get into the wolves a little later and because i gave you the comparison of this um I'll, I'll compare that and what i tell you about you know, it's comparatively is for a wolf um, in a little bit here, but get into the bobcat here. So a couple things, you know, bobcats is strictly something, unless you get really lucky that you're just finding in the winter in Yellowstone. In the last couple of years, the bobcats have not been as well. We have not seen as many. There was a time with bobcats along the Madison that West Yellowstone actually did a study and they found out these bobcats were worth about $300,000 or I think a little bit more than that to the town of West Yellowstone every year for photographers, cinematographers, people coming out and trying to see them. I did not see one this year. I did see one last year. Now, I think my first guide year guiding in the winter five years ago, I saw 10 or 12 in, a, in the winter. And so we're not quite sure why we're not seeing them as well. Um, but this is really typical. I talked about the coyote and how the coyote hunts and it's more of, you know, it sees an opportunity and it's going to go for that. You know, it's something that happens pretty fast with the bobcats. This is very typical. They might wait for hours for a duck or something to come by and they're hiding these log jams, you know, both the coyote and bobcat or ambush predators in this case, but just to kind of, you know, give you a little story um last year i only saw one bobcat and i was with a group of three photographers and they going out and they wanted to photograph the bobcat so luckily that morning i found bobcat tracks and we tracked the bobcat for a mile mile and a half down the road and it ended up going into this fishing platform there's a handicapped fishing platform along the madison river and it went right underneath of it and, you know, didn't see any tracks coming out. And it's one of those times I wasn't about to go put my face under there to find out if it was really there. So we waited until about 730 in the morning. And this is, I can't remember, February. It's, it's not warm out. So 730 to about 1130. And 1130 was the, that threshold for the three photographers. They said, we're cold, we're done. We need to go warm up. So we left for a half hour. And in that half hour we left, that bobcat jumped out, got a duck, swam the river, and was walking up this hillside. And we got back just in time. The, the three guys I was with actually never even saw the cat, and I was able to get a couple quick pictures off of it. And so that's just kind of that example of ambush hunting and how long and patient, you know, most of the time they're going to outlast anybody that's waiting for them. Uh, so now to the wolves. And so with a wolf, with just up front here, you can see the face. So this is going to have a broader snout than the coyote, um, broader face. And to compare the size, you know, I say with a wolf, you're looking something for more German shepherd to Malamute, but going to be bigger. It's going to have longer legs. They're going to have bigger paws, um, usually a broader face. And that's you know, and with wolves, you're looking anywhere from 90 pounds for a female to up to about 120 pounds on average for a male. 
And wintertime in Yellowstone, as far as the interior, it's kind of hit and miss. I've had some great experiences. This one in particular was incredible. Um, again, it was nice. I was with a group of photographers, and they had a carcass just off the road between Mammoth and Norse, where a section that not a lot of, you don't get as many people coming through. And this carcass was like 20 feet off the road, way too close, and people trying to get there, and the wolves were there. And so, you know, trying to keep everybody back. And at the same time, you know, when you see wolves, especially that distance, you're so excited. Everybody loves to see that. And so finally a ranger came by and, you know, in the wintertime, they give us, you know, a little bit more lenience and they, they set us up. I think it ended up being about 60 yards and said, don't cross this line and you guys can hang out here and and watch this. And so we got to watch these wolves go back and forth all day. And one of the, think the, the neatest experiences here for me is, in this pack at this time, a few years ago, there was about 21 wolves. And at one point they were on both sides of the the road and they just started howling back and forth together. And that's, I think one of the most incredible experiences to have the howling and experience that there. But in general, um, you, the wolves are not easy to find in the interior on the, in the winter time. Um, I do want to mention this wolf real quick while she's up. This is the alpha female of the Wapiti Lake Pack. So the Wapiti Lake Pack is the one that you're going to find in the interior of Yellowstone, typically. Uh, the most visible down here in the summertime, they're going to be more in Hayden Valley. Now, in the wintertime, this pack, um, I mentioned it's hard to, hard to see them in the interior a lot of times. And that's because the elk migrate out. You're not going to see any pictures of elk in the winter in the interior at least from the last two years previous to that you might we might have seven or so along the madison river that we would see and so the elk they leave the park and from the interior really they go north to, to lamar on the northern side they go out towards uh, big sky or ennis montana they'll go out to cody to the east and down to the jackson and the elk refuge to the south and so these wolves in the wintertime have a huge area they cover. I'm going to go back to this. Let's see if I can go back. Well, I won't worry about going back to the map right now, but just to give you an idea. So most of the time this pack this year hung up around petrified tree on the north side of the park, close to Tower Junction. Um, they were seen out, um, you know, from West Yellowstone all the way out to Hegbin Lake. They were seen over in the canyon and the mud volcano area down to Old Faithful. And a couple of them made it clear down to the Jackson Lake Lodge. So north to south in two days, that was about 72 miles as the crow flies that these wolves traveled. And so they travel that huge distance in search of food. Now this pack this year um, at its peak was 25. I think right now it's sitting around 16 wolves. And so they do hunt bison, but then that goes back to, you know, what's, you know, how much effort do they have to put in? What's the risk and what's the reward? Bison is a big reward, but it's also a big risk. You know, the Doug Smith with the the wolf project, he told us this year that the ideal number of wolves to take down an elk is four, you know, less can do it. He says, any more, they kind of get in the way. He says with the bison seen as many as 10 or more, you know, really 10 documented well taking down a bison and they haven't got that, you know, perfect number yet for how many wolves it would be to take down a, a bison. And so that's what they're doing is they're traveling around, you know, search for easy food sources. Uh, I put this one in here. This is a couple years ago, but I want you to, you know, same wolf here though. You have the alpha female, this white wolf. I think she's the only known white wolf in Yellowstone. And she's right here in the middle. But if you look at all of these wolves here, she's the only one with her tail up. She's flaunting herself. This is uh, this is in February, so we're getting close to meeting season. And right behind her, this is the alpha male. And so during this mating season, um, you know, they're flirting with each other. And she did this kind of throughout the whole day. Um, as she moved on from the river here, they went out. I think there's 14 wolves. There was two missing that day. 
with her a couple years ago. And that whole time um, she was, she was doing that same thing. And so again, that's one of those behaviors, you know, in February that people are looking for. Um, going on to, to bison. So I put this in here because bison love to travel the roadways as well as any other animals do. Um, so if I go back to this first wolf, that's right on the road. Um, these were crossing the road to get to their food. These traveled the road up until coaches started coming by and they found a different route. But all the animals like to travel the road in Yellowstone in the winter, especially on the interior. Um, well, the northern side of the park too, just because it's the easiest place, easiest place to travel. Um, the, I threw this in here because this bison, it's a big bull bison. Actually, I wanted to show this here too. So this is, I think, maybe the best comparison I have is check out her horns here. So this is a cow, a female up front, and this is a male in the back. And I, th I think I do have different examples, but side by side, this is nice. So when I tell people, you know, looking at a male versus a female, especially like this, you can see their head width is about the same, same beard size. I mean, it's our size. They're, they're very comparable. This is a, a cow, an older cow, and this is going to be a younger male. Um, and so what you want to look at here is the horns. So you, they say if the, the diameter of the base of the horn is smaller than the eye, the size of the eye or smaller, it's probably a female and her horns are going to curve more over the top of her head. Whereas a male, if you look at the base of the horn and compare it to the eye, it's usually bigger, bigger diameter than the eye. And the horns are going to stick up more like a goalpost, which you don't see very well in this young male yet. And this one, it's hard to tell with his profile. You're going to stick up more like a goalpost and have that bigger diameter. But this bison here is standing right over a hot spring. So you have all the steam coming over it, and it's freezing to the bison. And there's a couple things with this picture I want to mention. Is One, the ice buildup and the snow. I think a lot of people see that with pictures coming out of Yellowstone. And this bison is not cold. I mean, it is standing there at the thermal area, but it's not there necessarily for heat. It might get some heat from there, but these bison stay very comfortable with the temperatures. They say these fur coats they have on, you know, they can withstand temperatures negative 30 or so, maybe a little bit more than that. So this buildup of ice and snow the bison get is actually a sign of how warm they are. They're so well insulated that that heat's not escaping uh, to melt off that ice and that um the snow on the bison <clears throat> um this is kind of one of the reasons the bison like to hang out in the thermal areas because in those thermal areas which i'll show you let me skip ahead i had a couple here should have put this one so i should have put this up a little sooner but thermal area very little snow and so it's easy to get through those areas go back here and so the bison go into those thermal areas. They leave Hayden Valley in the winter. They go into the thermal basins because it's easier to maneuver. There's less snow on that side of the park, exposed grass, exposed vegetation, allowing them to be in those areas. This on the other hand, these big bull bison, I think they're just stubborn and they stay out in Hayden Valley. And this is quite the task here to get through this deep snow. This bison in particular, he would kind of lunge forward, maybe go a foot or so, and he'd stop and he'd be breathing. You'd see the snow, you know, blowing. And it, it was tough. And so these conditions out in Hayden Valley are not conducive to bison. And that bison, this is a 2,000-pound bull bison. You know, this is what I call the grumpy old man. He's out by himself. He's done with the herd life, usually past his prime. And there's not much that's going to touch him of Brogham unless he gets in a circumstance like this he is going to have a hard time defending himself against anything and so a couple more of the bison here this you can kind of see sticks up more like a goal post this is a bigger bull again what i call the grumpy old man where his horns are going to curve a little bit more but you know you have that broader head the bigger haircut you know, the fro on top and I mentioned, you know, I call these guys the grumpy old men. 
Um, when you get something more like this, when you get a herd of bison and you got, you see the small ones in there, there's a lot of cows, probably some young males. This is what we'd refer to as a nursing herd. So mostly cows, some calves, younger males with them. And that's going to how they're going to kind of hang out most of the year. And then you're going to have separate from that, a bachelor herd. So maybe four or five males that hang out. And then I mentioned the grumpy old men, the, the big bulls that hang out by themselves. And the other thing I, I want to show you here is, you know, going back to this one, you can see behind him, he's creating a line in the snow. So when they do have to go through the snow, you'll often see this straight line. You're going to have a matriarch that leads the way, breaks the trail, and everybody else will follow that same trail to where she's going. And then they'll stop and spread out as they're trying to get through the snow. And you'll see this cow. So this is an, this is an old cow. I mean, she's, she's about had it. I mean, you can see one horn gone. This one's, you know, often point the wrong way or misshaped. A um, couple things with this one snowy head. Uh, you see the bison a lot with these snowy heads because they're putting their head right down in the snow and they're trying to sweep that snow aside to get down to whatever vegetation is there. And, you know, their diet in the, the winter time. Well, the diet throughout the year, we, we compare it to a box of Cheerios. And so in the summertime, they get to eat the Cheerios and in the winter time, they get to eat the box. And so they're eating enough to just to keep their, you know, digestive system going to keep them alive. And, you know, something to think about is all these cows out here, all these females, um, these conditions, most of them are pregnant. And so, I mean, that survival is, you know, their, their rut is in August. They go into winter. It's a rough life out there. They're barely eating everything, anything. And they're pregnant on top of that. I just think it's incredible that what these, what these animals go through. Um, you know, what the, the incredible conditions again, and this is a warmer day, but this bison was, that snow was just sticking to it and it was comfortable. It was just putting its head in the snow and eating away. Um, another big bull bison, these big bulls like this are probably my favorite thing to, to photograph and watch in Yellowstone in the winter time. Um, you know, they, they travel the roads and they, they know who's in charge. Now it's during the, end of the season they're getting tired of us and they start charging coaches and tar charging the snowmobiles and wanting their turn on the road um this is something that you don't often see you'll see this in the spring or springtime and this goes back i want to show this one on the left here again that male the horns kind of stick up more like a goal post or i guess these two especially this one smaller horns that are really curved over the head you know, a calf over here on the right-hand side, 35 pounds in their first born, about 350 after that first year. But as far as them running down the road, you know, these animals going back to the energy conservation, I think this time of year, this was taken in, in March. They're like, we're almost through it, you know, and partially there's people on the road and they want to get by us and through us and they're done with us. And so most of the winter time, you're not going to see bison, bison moving like that and why i'm thinking about it here i don't have any slides i think that demonstrate this later but with the bison in yellowstone you know i'm always watching for behavior that kind of indicates something's going on when you see a herd of bison running i always i always look to see if there's something you know wolves or a bear but bison tend to be that one that run just because they can whereas if you see elk running find out what's chasing them find out what's wrong because they, I mean, if they're not sleeping, eating, chewing their cud, you know, something is going on. That's a behavior that, you know, I found wolves that way is, you know, they're up looking around, they're running, they're on the move. You want to see what makes them do that. So typically, you know, animals aren't burning calories just to do it. I shared this. Get to the otter here before I go on. Um, sometimes I feel like I'm just rambling on. Uh, if you do have any questions, you know, I can't really see much of anybody's faces, you know, feel free to unmute yourself and, um, go ahead and shout something out. Um, otherwise I'm going to keep going here with, um, otters in the winter time. 
you know, I think winter time again is the best time to see otters. And the reason for that is, you know, especially I guess you should say on the, the Yellowstone river. Um, the Yellowstone river is one river that will almost all, you know, freeze up. There's a lot of ice on it. There's very few places that are open. And so those otters are kind of forced into those areas with open water. And so one place that we see them at the Chittenden Bridge, which is the bridge that takes you across Yellowstone River, if you're going towards the south rim of the Grand Canyon of Yellowstone. And so um, that's the time of year that we'll see otters. Occasionally we'll get them on other places in the park, um, in the interior. I know going to the north side of the park seems like it's January, first part of February. Um, Soda Butte and Lamar River going back to the confluence is a great place to see otters and most years down in Grand Teton National Park on the Moose Wilson Road over through the beaver dams is a great place to see otters as well in the winter time and usually it's January when it's the coldest as February starts to come around it starts to warm up we're seeing less ice especially in the March and so they they travel along the rivers and notice the way that this river or this well, this otter's going along here. Notice the tail dragging. And so when I drive along the river, I am watching for tracks because it's you can't track an otter in the river. That's almost impossible to try to figure out where it's at. So I'm watching for tracks anywhere, everywhere I go. And in this case, you know, instead of, you know, it might be a distance away, but look for a tail drag for an otter. The other thing otters do, which I don't have any pictures of, is they like to slide. So they'll drop and slide. So along the river, look for slide marks. The other thing to look for is this here. This is going to be a latrine site. So otters, um, you know, it's their, I guess their scent marking. So they, they will have glands in their back feet. And so what they do is they'll go up and they'll, they'll defecate near, or urinate. And then they kind of pounce their back feet and they're leaving the scent behind. And otters will, you know, they might have a, a rock they do it on or a log pile or certain places that they do this. And so multiple otters will do it. And it's kind of the, I don't know, the find out what's going on. It's a local gossip. You don't have to talk to another otter. You go there, you smell and be like, oh, you know, Bob was here and he was just passing through or, he, you know, whatever it was. So, and that goes with all animals. I mean, so from... The sense of animals, I mean, they can tell if it was a male or female that came through, if they're an estrus, if they're old, if they're sick. I, I heard recently, I, well, I guess it's been a little bit now, but wolves, you know, uh, can go and find out if it's the alpha in the area, if it's a dominant wolf, or maybe it's a, a male that's off by itself looking for a partner. So there's a lot of information that comes from scent marking. And that's what these otters do. And in this case, it's, you know, partially, uh, you know, well, it looks like, you know, you got a couple males in the area um, that are going to be defensive. I'm going to keep on going down river and you get, and I'll, I'll try to bring up some of that scent marking with some of the animals later as well. And the, the information that that provides, but, you know, I look for latrine sites like this um, bald eagles. Uh, I think, I think winter in Yellowstone is the best time to see the bald eagles. These two here, I enjoyed this. Um, you have, you know, the larger one here on the left, which I believe is the female, followed, you know, shorter one, the male, the smaller of the two. And this is right at Mud Volcano. Um, and these are the most tolerant eagles, I think, in the world. I mean, I've seen people go up, you know, less than 20 yards from these guys, and they just kind of sit there and let you take pictures. You know, vehicles pull up and all the coaches have the backup beeper on it. And so you're, you're 35, 40 yards from these birds and you're backing up with this beeper on or snowmobiles are going by and they could care less. So it provides some great opportunity. And there's some places throughout Yellowstone, you know, along the Madison River, there's specific perches I look for. If you haven't been to Yellowstone for a couple of years, there was a bald eagle nest along the Madison just before Seven Mile Bridge for years. That did bl blow down. It hadn't been used for years either, but it blew down a couple of years ago now. There's another nest um, out in kind of that first meadow you come to after Seven Mile Bridge, uh, way up on the hillside. 
and uh, there's a great bald eagle nest actually out in Lamar Valley. The first big pull out on top of the hill with the big log beam going across it, just across the valley there. So there's great places and visible places for them, but I think the in the winter time is the best time to see them. We'll see them often perched in these favorite snags they have. But something I, I wanted to bring up here, as I mentioned, tolerant. And so you'll see a lot of these pictures, you know, especially the coyotes and foxes and things. I mean, some of these animals, you know, you, you're trying to back up so you can be 25 yards from them. So tolerant is okay. Tolerant is the animals realize that we are here and they have to live with us. Bison on the road, coyotes walking down the road past our vehicles. People are surprised all the time that, you know, shouldn't that coyote run off? And so tolerant is one thing. What we don't want is habituated. And habituated is maybe you grab that bag of chips or something, they hear a crinkle and they're coming over looking for food and they're walking up to you purposely, you know, looking for handouts and things. And so, you know, all these, these photos I have in here, <clears throat> there's only one that, and I'll mention it, I want to say is habituated, but uh, found a reward from food. And so that's one of the great things is you get a lot of these tolerant animals with 4 million people visiting Yellowstone a year that get comfortable and realize that, you know, just like that coyote walking through a herd of bison. Yeah. These guys aren't going to bug me. I know they're here. You know, these Eagles were very tolerant. Um, Clark's nutcrackers. You know, I would say, you know, and I should, I should have mentioned this when I introduced myself up front is I consider myself a Jack of all trades, master of none. So I know, um, a little bit about a lot of things. So I try to, I try to share what I do know. And I would say, um, we see more Clark's nutcrackers down lower in the interior of the park during the winter time. Uh, they do have a vertical migration. Um, I know some of them stay up, but just compare that to being in the park. I don't, you still see them down in these lower elevations, like at mud volcano or sometimes through the picnic areas, but you see a lot more of them uh, throughout the park in the winter time as as they're coming down and actually i should mention this is one of those um it's you can't tell this is actually just outside the park and just below it is a bird feeder i was i got some other photos and i forgot to add those to this slideshow but these clark's nutcrackers a couple things about them that i just find inc incredible um i believe that it's they can have up to fifty thousand different caches and they have a great memory. They think it's a, you know, it's a spatial memory. It's um, mm -hmm. triangulating things. So when they cache something, they kind of use this triangulation method to remember where things are hidden at. And the, I believe it's the frontal cortex actually expands on its head with this information. And as it hides the different caches, and then through the years, it starts taking those caches you know, it doesn't have as much to remember. And then at the end of the season, it kind of wipes that memory and then it starts all over again. So they hide caches and is they only need that memory for the time that that, that food is, I guess they need the food. That memory's wiped and they start caching again. And what's so important about these birds in Yellowstone is that's one of the big ways that the white bark pine tree um regenerates itself is through birds like this or squirrels or different things caching those nuts caching the seeds and allowing it to grow and it's also important to grizzly bears so i'll probably get more into the bears and the pine nuts later but uh, the grizzly bears they don't climb the trees and so they're looking for caches left over from the clark's nutcracker um, i have this pine gross beak in here i think i did this by accident it should be a a cross bill um but I do see the pine gross beaks occasionally in the winter in Yellowstone. Um, I see a lot more um, crossbills. And typically, you know, it's, it's hard to get photos of them. You usually hear them as they're flying across in a flock or you sometimes you'll, you'll get them perched in some areas. And it's one I always try to point out the crossbills because that crossbill is so unique. And it's something that people find fascinating and, you know, why the bill is crossed. Um, great horned owl. I threw this in here because it's not a, a regular one that we see in the wintertime, but there's been a couple in the winter along the Gibbon River. 
<clears throat> have been seen. And so we do have these great horned owls um, in the winter time. I don't have a picture in here during for the, this time period, but as far as great gray owls, very rare. Um, in the last five years, I saw a first great gray owl in the interior of the park in the winter last year. And that was over by um, fountain paint pots area. And so just kind of between Midway Geyser Basin the, and fountain paint pots. And it, one was seen in this year in that same area. And again, this is kind of my personal opinion. I can't say for sure an educated guess. I wonder if these great grays, if there's some of them are staying in these areas in Yellowstone with the thermal areas because you don't have that snow depth where a lot of owls are dropping elevation to get away from that deeper snow. If these ones are staying in the park in those thermal areas because it's easier access, just like the bison or anything else is in that area for. Um, I have a few here. We got the snow bunting, uh, red-breasted nuthatch, junco, chickadee, and um, killdeer. And these are all in the winter. These don't look like they're in the winter per se. Is you have all this green here. This is in typically in February. We start seeing these birds using, especially the small ones, using these thermal areas. And so the green, it's kind of like a greenhouse effect. You have the moisture coming off the thermals. You have the heat. And it keeps these areas green throughout, throughout the wintertime. And all of these birds take advantage of that. And... Like you can see here, imagine going after seeds in those areas. Um, this kill deer is, so all of these other ones that I showed, um, this is fountain paint pots that they show up in and spend a lot of time there. You'll see them a lot. This junco is actually at Mud Volcano. And so is this kill deer. And this kill deer spent all winter there. Well, most of it. I think we first saw it in mid-January and when the park, you know, last day of the we were able to get out there it was still hanging around and so again it's open areas but what i find fascinating about this is you know for example at mud volcano half the bacteria half the organisms or even you know 99 percent of them i probably can't even pronounce what's out there there's all kinds of things out there you know i narrow it down to there's things like thermophiles extremophiles acidophiles so file meaning loving so things that love extreme conditions, the acids, the heat. Um, and then you have things like mercury, arsenic, sulfuric acid. You have all kinds of these, you know, in high temperatures, you know, high temperatures anywhere from 110 to 200 degrees. Anything for us, this is all going to cause death. And yet these birds are out there, these, and they survive in it. The killdeer in particular will lay its eggs out in these thermal areas. Uh, I'm surprised they don't become hard boiled sometimes. Maybe that does happen. But in these thermal areas, and I read a study, this is years ago. I can't remember the exact details, but I know that they took feathers from the kill deer that were in these areas. And they found a higher concentration of mercury in these birds than what there should be for them to live. And it goes back to adaptations. Um, they've adapted for these areas to be able to live here. Um, I'll try to remember and get into that with the elk later. The elk have some kind of the same type of adaptations. But that's one of the things that I find fascinating is you have these thermal activity areas and with all of these things that cause us death and there's, there's life that still lives amongst it. Um, with the dusky grouse here, we don't see these very often. Um, it, usually around Madison Junction in the wintertime. That's one that does show up. And I just, for me, it's just amazing how brazen these birds are. Um, I don't know if they're just afraid of everything out there that's going to eat them. So they figure that we're safe and they come up to us. I mean, on top of the snow coaches, under the snow coaches, and right up to people. Um, but this is one, and I have some more later in different areas that you'll find the dusky grouse. Um, ravens, you know, ravens are one of the first bird. Well, I think the first bird in this area in Yellowstone that starts courting, and that's what they're what's going on here. Be a male and female, they start setting up territories, and they're you know very intelligent birds. 
Um, they one of the they hang around the parking lots a lot because they will actually they're waiting for snowmobiles to show up or for a coach to have an open window and with the the snowmobiles specifically with the the backpacks they go in and they unzip the backpacks and they start pulling stuff out looking for food they know it's a food source <laughs> and with this i want to mention this one particularly you'll see the leg bands on this and there's a study going on, and it's a citizen science-based one. They want people's help. And there's an app. I never knew this app was available until I heard about the study. It's called Animal Tracker. And I was just on it earlier and looking in Idaho Falls. There's a couple cinnamon teals. I think those are the only ones right now. I know a few of these ravens up end up down that way. But they actually have GPS backpacks on them, and you can track them basically in real time. And I was looking and the app wasn't working like it should have earlier for me um, to try to find one of these ravens. I think in the study, they wanted to put um, backpacks on like 60 ravens. And so these ravens in Yellowstone, I think is the one at Mud Volcano, flies back and forth to Idaho Falls. And so you can see the distance these ravens travel and where they're going, where they their territory is and where they're going to find food. And so each one has a specific leg band and you can get on the app and say, you know, I saw the, the yellow over silver and gray over red, find out what Raven is, submit your picture and any details. And so what their study is really about is they're looking at trying to find out more information on the relationship between Ravens and wolves, which we know a little bit about, but they're trying to get more into it. And these ravens with this beak is not meant to get into a carcass. Their, their talons are not meant to open anything. And so they will lead wolves to these carcasses. And in turn, the wolves share that food with the ravens. So that's the study that they're, they're looking into. So if you happen to be, you know, there's a lot of ravens down your way. But if you see one with those leg bands, take a picture and maybe submit it there. And that, that app, again, is Animal Tracker. Um, I also, there's a, a Osprey on there. I think it's one of my favorites. It's called, uh, its name is Avery. And right now I believe it's in central Mexico. And every year I can watch it as it makes its journey north and it nests between Gardner, Montana and Livingston. And then, it, you know, you can watch its pattern as it uh, flies back and forth. A raven, you know, the, this blue heron that spent the winter in Yellowstone. I always kind of think it's interesting is, you know, whether it's, you know, oh, all the blue herons flew south, the killdeers are gone, the, the robins are gone, or they just came back is it's amazing how many birds actually stay here in the wintertime. Um, I think it's often confusing that, you know, we relate these birds to flying south for the winter, but there are a number of them that do hang out here. And I think this, this uh, blue heron is here because the Madison, again, the water's open. Um, has a food source, and as far as this blue heron's concerned, there's no other competition as far as herons around right now. Um, brown creeper, you know, I can't say for sure, but it seems like it's not until February that I start seeing a lot more brown creepers hanging around. I start hearing them. Don't we have those in our backyard? Yeah, so, little birds flitting around the tree. Yeah, so we'll we'll see these throughout area and for whatever reason in Yellowstone and they might be there a little bit more common in the winter but it seems like February I really start seeing these mixing with the the flocks of chirkitties and things and this was neat because you have this big Douglas fir and the the beak on it it was it was nice to see using that beak kind of how it was designed probing into that bark looking for things and pulling things out um that it was eating um you know, you, you can't talk about Yellowstone without talking a little bit about the thermal features in the park. And so we got um, Castle Geyser here. In Yellowstone, I say everything's a lot more uh, dramatic. You have a lot more steam, a lot more snow. Um, sometimes, you know, for Old Faithful, it's hard to tell if, you know, if you got a lot of snow, wind, and gray skies. Sometimes it's hard to separate where the water is and where the sky or is, but it's... It's an incredible experience here in the winter because there's not 4,000 of you watching it and you can hear it. And, you know, you get a blue sky day like this and it's, it's a beautiful area. 
Um, this here, I want to just throw in here because this is Steamboat Geyser, which got a lot more active uh, March 15th of 2018. And in the wintertime, and this goes for any thermal area, whether it's steam or the water, and this goes off, it shoots out a lot of water, has a lot of steam, and everything becomes an icicle. And so it kind of kills everything around it. A um, few other, oh, I got this. Um, this is opalescent pool at uh, Black Sand. I think this is one of my favorite uh, hot springs in the park in the wintertime because of how easy it is to see. There's not as much steam coming off because of the temperature here. And just a neat setting with the, the dead trees through here. A few other species, see a lot of red squirrels in the wintertime. Um, pine martens, these are tough. In this case, these two, well, I think any of them that I saw this year, it has to do with food. You know, at Madison Junction, or this case, it was over at the Canyon area. And you might have seen a lot of pictures of these guys come out this winter. And it was because there was a, a little utopia they found of a, a dumpster that hadn't been emptied from this last, uh, this last summer. So they were very skittish around us still, but at the same time, there was a food source. I'm hoping they didn't uh, incorporate that with people. A um, couple of them were hanging around there. And, you know, with these guys in Yellowstone, I, I would guess that there's not many buildings in Yellowstone that has not had a Pine Martin in it. Um, I know different buildings that uh, these guys have spent the winter in. I know a couple years ago down at Flag Ranch, the lodge there while it was closed the uh, pine martins spent time in there eating their huckleberry box cakes and so these guys are very good at finding their way into places so on a pine martin if you're not familiar with them it's part of the weasel family um i wanted to throw this in here this is a mountain lion uh, not a great picture but this considering it was it was dark outside and this is a six second exposure and so this was down in Jackson, and this was, you guys might have heard about this one, hanging out behind the Maverick in town for about a week. So it's about this time of year, February, March, you start hearing about mountain lions, especially around the Elk Refuge. So the mountain lions I've seen, there's two in Jackson, one here just on the edge of town, and the other one was out in the Elk Refuge. And then same thing happens in Yellowstone on the Northern range. Occasionally, you know, I think it's the best time to see them up there too. A lot of it has to do with people looking for wolves at a far distance and coming across the mountain lion. Uh, my first mountain lion was uh, a mom and two kittens were about six months old and they were a mile and a half away in the winter in a snowstorm through a spotting scope. And that's typically how we see the mountain lions in the park. So very elusive, not many of them out there, but winter time seems to be when, when they're seen the most, or I guess that winter transition to spring and March. Um, long-tailed weasel. So we have you have long tail, then you have short tailed weasels. And the long tail is gonna have a longer tail, and the short tailed is the one they're gonna refer to as an ermine. So not both of them are ermine, just the, the short tailed is one that's referred to as an ermine when it turns white. They turn white in the wintertime. And the best way, I mean, these guys, they're hard to see. The only, I guess, the number way, one way that I found them is I know what their tracks look like. And so when I see tracks, I just start following and watching the tracks. Most of the time, they'll, well, not most of the time, a bit of the time, they'll end up leading to the culprit who made the tracks. But I want to point this out, that, that longer tail. Um, and I know that these guys, maybe you've seen them at Market Lake. I know in the springtime, you know, I see them at Market Lake when they're they're brown. But I want to point out that black tip on the tail. Um, if a hawk or something's going after this, it's a lot easier for that to lose a tail than lose a head. And so that's what's attracting anything. You know, it's what you catch is that black tip on the tail as it moves around. Um, because I never get pictures of them, uh, snowshoe hair. Those are its tracks. You see tracks all the time in the winter in Yellowstone. I've only seen one one or two times. Seems like most of the time when somebody sees a snowshoe hare, it's because a pine martin is chasing it. And, you know, they're more active at dawn and dusk. And I would say in the springtime, April, May, 
up above Norris is probably where I've seen them the most is out of that winter season. But I mean, it's, it's amazing to see how many tracks are really out there in the winter, just to know, I mean, it's, it's like there's thousands of these rabbits around. You just never see them and they turn white as well. So that's kind of ending with uh, the winter season. That's a whole lot in there. Um, and I probably should go a little faster to make sure we cover all of this. I'll get into these other months here. Um, but to this point, any questions for me? So I'll keep going. Um, this case here, this is a white-tailed jackrabbit. It's not very common to see, but you're looking for these, I think, mammoth um, in that transition from winter to spring is probably the best time to see these. And mammoth is the only place that I've really heard about them being seen or I've seen them myself. Um, you know, this time of year is when grizzly bears start coming out. So, you know, you do get some activity in March. I think, you know, if you've seen the news or anything, you've probably heard that grizzly bears are out in Yellowstone already. Um, this year, I think it was 2015, 2016, this was the very first sighted grizzly bear in Grand Teton National Park. And you see I've labeled that as April 12th. And so, you know, it's the big males that come out first typically. So starting in March, you know, visibility is usually less. You don't see them. You get into April, you start seeing big, you know, more of these boars, these males. And that is, I, I think, the best time to try, you know, and into May, into May is to see the big males before they disappear into the backcountry. Um, this is a big male. Um, this was, this was fun. I have a whole series where all of a sudden it decided to stop, drop and roll. Just rolled through the snow, got up and kept on going. Um, that, you know, and it's this time of year in the spring, April, May is also the best time to try to catch the bears in the geyser basins. And every year that's, you know, you can see them throughout the park, you know, a lot through the summer into the fall. Uh, it's not often that you get them in the geyser basins, which kind of creates a unique setting. And so, and sometimes they cr close the geyser basins on us before our winter season closes because of dead animals out there. And so these bears are coming out of hibernation in anticipation of animals dying through the winter time. Um, you can see this May 1st. That's about the date that we start seeing the grizzly bears with cubs. So cubs of the year, often they're referred to as coys is when we still we start seeing them for the first time is they, they hibernate the longest, so May 1st. And what I want to mention here, these this is the same bear, different years, different cubs. Um, there's what we refer to as roadside bears in Yellowstone. And as you, if you look here, if you know the Gibbon River, these are all taken right along the Gibbon River. And I'm not very far from that bear. Either is... 50 other people. And this, this bear is a known bear to the rangers and they know the behavior. And so based on that, they is where they allow people to stand. And this bear, I think the rangers would have ended up backing us up, but it happened so fast. She was out grazing up a little higher, came down the river, got a drink and went back up. But with roadside bears, there are bears in the park, Yellowstone and Grand Teton that raise their cubs next to the road because it's the safest place for the cubs. The males um, get the best territory, which is usually away from the road. And the males will kill the cubs to put the females back in heat. So this, this bear specifically, this is the Burrell Springs bear. Um, this one has a couple different names. It's often referred to as the obsidian sow. She came out a couple, two years ago with three cubs. And so and I know that there's, you know, challenges with people sharing information where animals are located. Um, I have no problem sharing with you where, you know, I mean, almost exact locations of these, because if you go to Yellowstone, you're going to find them. I mean, just walk for 50 cars parked along the side of the road. And that's, that's how I, you know, I feel about Yellowstone is there's some things I'll keep a, on a lower profile, but some of these, when you got, 50 people or a hundred cars parked already, you know, you're going to find that location if you just drive through the park. So there's some things I'm very um, specific about. So with these bears, I mean, you have a roadside bear that hangs out by Burl Springs. 
You have one that hangs out by Obsidian Cliff. Uh, you have one over by Yellowstone Lake and Lake Butte. Um, and photographers name these bears. I'm not a big fan of naming the bears. And honestly, if you showed me three or four of these bears lined up and tried to tell me, you know, get me to tell you which one's which, I couldn't tell you. I only know because of where they're at and how many cubs they have every year. So you have raspberry over by Lake Butte. Going down the Grand Teton, you might have heard of 399 or 610. Um, both, you know, very famous bears down that way. So you have these roadside bears throughout the park, which are great opportunities in the springtime and May to June. Well, May and into June to be able to see these bears. That's when they first start coming out. Um, with this bear, so, you know, this is cub of the year. First year just came out of hibernation. These bears, this is the next year. This is May again. And so they're going to hang out with mom all that summer as well. And then this coming spring, in particular in these case, um, these bears will be kicked out. So it's that third summer that they get kicked out. And bears start courting. So you can see this is the very end of May, May 28th. And so usually sometime in May, June to early July, it's courting season for grizzly bears. And so the one on the left is going to be the male, the bear, a uh, boar. One on the right's the sow, the female. And one thing that's pretty common with these bears most of the time is the male. Most of the time is going to be a darker bear like this, and most of the time females are a little lighter. Um, oftentimes, I'll I'll be looking at a grizzly bear. You know, I might be looking for one a mile, two miles away. You know, like, well, how, how do you know it's a grizzly bear or a black bear? How can you tell it's a long ways away? See this blonde spot right here on the shoulder? For me, this is a, a pretty good giveaway. She has it too. If that bear turns just right, I mean, that kind of lights up. And you can see that stripe. And that's one thing that I'm looking for. Um, you know, looking for a hump on its back. You're going to have more of a dish face where black bears are going to have more of a a straighter face so a couple things to look for there on the on the bears you know and this one the skunk this should have gone i think back a little bit rather than april to may uh, they really start coming out of hibernation up here in march i start seeing bears i i'm going out and doing these looking for owls right now and listening for them and and this is just as much of a bear i'm watching for these skunks i've seen a lot of them out this time of year um, bison calves, so they're the first ones to, we start seeing. So bison calves, we start seeing in, in um, April to May, first calves that come. Um, this, I just, I threw this in here because sometimes what these will do, I've seen bison calves in that high water get swept down, um, down river. What sometimes what bison will do is they will actually have the calves swim on the other side or they'll make a line across the river and then let the calves come through and let them cross first. Um, bison have some neat behaviors. They also, um, you know, have what you might consider a funeral um, where they, it looks like they're mourning over the, the dead animals. Um, you know, something about these animals and you think, well, that's, that's smart. Those animals are letting the calves cross. And I took this um, animal behavior class and something that was mentioned is and often, you know, how smart is the animal? How do you compare it? And though I thought this was the best answer was every animal is as intelligent as it needs to be to survive. And so that goes with all these animals. That's how intelligent they are. Um, bison calf. So brand new. We, we call them red dogs when they're first born. Um, this time of year, you start getting babies. Um, you have the big horn sheep here. Uh, bighorn sheep, best time, best place, I think, throughout the year, you know, coming into this time to see them is going to be Calcite Springs Overlook into the canyon on the far side. That's where bighorn sheep, uh, they have their, the ewes have their, uh, their lambs. Harlequin ducks show up. This one's luckily not very often. You get them on the Madison. This was on the Madison a couple of years ago. Most of the time they're going to be over at Lahardy Rapids. And so, you know, again, the, the males are going to stick around for just a short time. Later, I have a, a picture of the females that are still hanging around in August, might be September. Um, so you get the Harlequin ducks. 
you get a lot of loons that start showing up around this time. Um, Yellowstone Lake seems to be a pretty good place to see them in the spring and the fall. Not a great population of, of loons. Um, for multiple reasons right now, they're working on that population. Ravens start to, are on the nest. You might recognize this one. This nest has been around for a long time. This is right across from Rustic Falls as you go down to Mammoth Hot Springs. Um, I think it's kind of moved over to the right now a little bit where they're using, but they're still nesting in this area. Um, dippers, this is a dipper nest. And if anybody has been on the Rescue Creek Trail between Mammoth and Gardner, this nest is right under that bridge um, at Rescue Creek. You know, I didn't throw any dippers in in um, the March to, um, or excuse me, November to March. I should have. It's probably the best time to see dippers in the winter along like the fire hole or the Yellowstone. There's a lot of them that we see that spend the winter here. Um, going back to the dusky grouse, this is going to be a male. And they start calling or um, I guess showing off at that time. Um there's a couple consistent places to see this. This one's on the Beaver Ponds Trail, just uh, above Mammoth Hot Springs. Uh, also over by Petrified Tree. Seems to be a good place to, to locate these birds. Um, this is the only... Um, oh, I just lost the name. Um, thank you. Pileated woodpecker that I think they know it well, a pair of them that they know about in Yellowstone. And this is on that um, beaver, beaver ponds trail again above Mammoth Hot Springs. I guess they've been, I haven't been back there for a couple years now, but I guess for years they had nested back in that area on the beaver ponds trail, which is quite unique. It's first time and the only one that I've ever seen was in Yellowstone. Um, Ruffed grouse start to, and this is probably a little, you know, a lot of this is changes based on elevation as well, or based on where you're at, you know, they'll start, I've heard them, I think last year, I guess in Island Park, uh, yeah, in April, so that's right, April um, into, into May, where I've heard them beating their wings in this area. And, you know, if you don't know this, the, the grouse, they, they find their favorite log. And they'll have different logs. So there's been times where, you know, I've seen a grouse beating on a log. You might have jumped it or scared it and it, it goes off. Um, watch that log later. There's a good chance that it might come back to the same spot um, to, to do the same thing. Um, Stellar's Jays, you know, it's, I want to say that there's a particular season that, I'm going to see these more often than not. I'd say, you know, more throughout the summer from, you know, May through all the way through September, October, not as often in the winter time that I see them. There was one hanging around mud volcano this year. So they'll be frequent visitors at camp or not campsite. Well, probably campsites, but picnic areas, same with the gray or Canada J um, often at the, picnic areas too and it's not just like show up at 10 o'clock in the morning and hope to see a gray jay at a picnic area it's wait till 12 o'clock when it's lunchtime then they show up i mean they they know what time to be there um put a couple cross bills in here this is actually at harriman state park um this last year and i think may at this time eating off the ground and see him quite a bit at harriman during that time um, this is the only time that I've seen this species uh, in Yellowstone. This is a bull snake, and it's one of five species of snake in the park. And around Mammoth Hot Springs is going to be the best place to see these snakes, these bull snakes. Again, in this case, it's a, a male and a female. So getting into June, uh, June is going to be my favorite probably my favorite month in the park you know it starts to get pretty and i think it's the best time for wildlife um things green up you get the wildflowers it's not too busy yet um june is just a, a wonderful time to be in the park here this is just outside the park it's an island park but 
it's time of year that most of the babies are around by this time most all the babies are have been born so moose uh, you start seeing more of the bighorn sheep uh, the elk calves we say the last week of may first week of june is when they're born and it's usually just after that time when you actually start seeing them kind of up and traveling more this is along the madison river and what uh, i learned here with the madison is with this elk herd is i guess the the elk have developed some kind of antibody to the mercury in the river with the the fire hole and the the madison river with the everything that flows in there and as they clean their calves off as they're licking their ears and the mouth and things they're passing that antibody on you know from the mercury to the calves at that time uh, so again another um you know way that they have developed or adapted to to this environment so all of these animals the pronghorn um pronghorn really lamar valley through the summertime is where you're going to find them kind of the best place you won't see them in the interior of yellowstone ever um i i would say june for me you know may is pretty good too i think june is hands down one of the best months to see bears um, two years ago in June, in a single day, I saw 20 different bears. Uh, it's between grizzly and black bears. Sometimes they're close. Um, this is the one up here on the hill. This is known as raspberry. This is our cub snow. These are the, the roadside bears. And this, this bear here, Snow, she'll probably come out with cubs this year. Raspberry did this last year. And so that could be if she follows her mom's footsteps and raises them along the road. That could be a great experience to see um, bears along that area. And so, you know, between grizzly and black bears, I think, you know, June is the best time and places to see the bears in the park. So grizzly bears are more valleys, open areas. So Ooh. Lamar Valley, Hayden Valley, um, Swan Lake Flats. And so that's typically where you're going to find them. And they might be close. Um, you know, if you go out in May to June, and you start scanning the high elevations in Lamar Valley, you're going to find bears up there. I mean, it's guaranteed. There, I mean, It takes a little bit more looking up high. You can find them down low too. But there, there's a lot of bears out there. Sometimes you see them 10 feet off the road. Sometimes you have to put a little bit of work in and get your scope out and might be looking a mile away, but you can find them um, through June. And that, for that matter, I haven't got to July yet. That, that goes into July as well. And so, again, baby animals, this is uh, yellow-bellied marmots or rock chucks, um, badgers. This badger den, it's another one of those that last two years they used it. I'm hoping they do again this year. Um, it's, it's not a secret. They tape it off, and there's, a, you know, right across from the um, petrified tree entrance. Um, there's a little burrow down there, a little um, ditch-looking area. Just look for the fresh dirt and the photographer's spend all day right there and so this is a, a badger den and so you start seeing badgers at that time this is out in lamar valley again i think june um is the best time i guess probably into july um to see the badgers and the best areas are going to be lamar valley you know watch for open dirt areas it's tough in the sagebrush but i would say one of the best areas is down the slough creek road to try to find badgers I've seen them once or twice in Hayden Valley, but just seen a lot of signs for them, a lot of holes, but just haven't seen uh, numbers down that way. Oh, pronghorn again. Swans. Uh, this is at Harriman State Park this last year. There was They were very successful. I want to say there was four successful nesting pairs of swans, mm -hmm. and it was something like five, five, four, maybe four signets or something close to that so they were very successful so start seeing um the, the swans um and i'm going to show this again some swans in from jackson a few years ago look very similar to this but not until july so again sometimes it's based on elevation or successful nesting so you can get them at different times but i know all four pairs at um Harriman State Park were 
right around the beginning of June this last year. Same with Sandhill Cranes. The Sandhill Cranes early June in um, this is Slough Creek. And then I don't, I don't think I have it here after, you know, probably a week, week and a half after those ones at Sioux Creek, the ones at uh, Harriman State Park were hatched. Um, wolves in, in June, May to June are good. Um, so oh. at that time, the, the wolves already have dens and they got to go back and forth feeding the puppies. Um, I would say the best chance to see wolves is going to be uh, in at Slough Creek. If that keeps up, because every year at Slough Creek, about a mile and a quarter away, the wolves den there. The den is out in the open. And with a spotting scope, you can see you know, people are there when the puppies come out for the first time. Uh, this one in particular is out in Hayden Valley. And so in the springtime, it can be good in Hayden Valley. But these wolves have moved around from place to place where their den is at. And the last couple of years, they spent a lot of time in areas that just aren't as visible. So usually looking for wolves, I'm going up into Lamar Valley. Elk are still in the velvet during this time. Um, same with uh, the moose. Um, this pika, and not only the pika here, they're, they're out, but the wildflowers start during this time. Um, you know, my favorite for wildflowers, the bears out in them. This, these are arrow leaf balsam root. This one's partic particularly down in, in Jackson and Grand Teton National Park. Um, this is in Island Park, and this is going to be camas in bloom in June. Uh, this is that camas, and this is a long billed curlew that was nesting, that had a nest out there that kept on. Um, she came out of nowhere and was leading me away from that nest. And you'll see them occasionally in Yellowstone, no great places. But down on the Mormon Row area in Grand Teton National Park, they nest. And you can see them quite often down there. Um, every year, it seems like there's a certain hatch. And these um, Western Tanagers show up at Harriman State Park. It's just incredible. Last year, I stopped uh, right at the outlet for Silver Lake. And there was... I don't know, 20 of these flying around. And I just went and sat down by the water so I can take some pictures. And I had one land on my feet, my foot. I mean, it was, they were just all over the place. And so that's a great, and if you want to come up at Harriman, I can get, you know, I'll get you the contact information for me at the end of the slide show here. And if anybody wants to know exactly when that is, I'll look at the dates that I have. And it's amazing how many tanagers are in just this little area for about a week and then they disappear. Um, and these are all really close. This is when I was sitting down, just watching them pick out the insects. Um, this is up high, just outside the park on the Beartooth Highway. In June, I've been very successful with uh, these finches up there, as well as American pipits up that way. Uh, going back to a pine martin, you know, the only reason I found this guy is because a squirrel was alarm calling. I said, up, oh, something's going on. Sure enough, there's a pine martin. Uh, again, right at Canyon Village, most of the time you see these there across the road and gone, not around very, very long. Um, shooting stars uh, become plentiful in the park. Um, they get a bear in here. This is July to August. And you'll notice all of this is cow parsnip, which cow parsnip is a very important part of uh, a grizzly bear diet. Um, so this is out on a little island that swam out to there. Um, I, I put two put two wolves in here. So I want to show you the difference between these. So one, notice that there's not as thick of a coat as in the wintertime. So they don't have that beautiful thick coat on them. Um, but notice the size of these wolves. Notice how big this wolf's head is compared to this one. Very skinny head. So this is a young wolf. Um, it might have been a yearling or just over that. Um, I guess a year and a half old or so. But then this is a male wolf. A male wolf is going to have a much larger, larger head, broader snout. Um, and I think this was the alpha male, actually. And so just a good comparison, not great pictures, but comparison of those those wolf size and, uh, you know, the, the thinner coat on them. One of my favorite flowers, um, 
Elephant's head um, is very prevalent at this time. I think the best place for elephant head is going to be Gibbon Meadows, just off the road in those moist areas. Um, July and August. So I should give you an overview of July and August. Um, hottest, busiest time of the month. I hear so often people are like, oh, you don't want to go to Yellowstone in July and August because it's too busy. There's too many people. It's like, well, you know what? There's a lot of people in Chicago, in New York, Idaho Falls. Um, there's a lot of people. And so it's, it's, I don't think it's a bad time to go. You have to be a little bit more patient or just go before, get in the park at seven o'clock. Um, that's what I do. And you get in at seven o'clock, there's no line, there's no people. You go out and see the wildlife before everybody. And, or you go to the hot springs in the morning in the summertime. It's still 35, 40 degrees. So you might have a bit more steam. Or the other thing is just stay until after five o'clock, wait until after five. You'll notice a huge line of people leaving the park and you're going in and there's, it's light until 10, lots of parking. Um, and it is the best time to see the hot springs. Um, the sun is the highest, it's the hottest. The colors pop the most during this time. This one is at, um, this is Abyss Pool. And this is at uh, West Thumb Geyser Basin right off the lake. The Grand Prismatic Hot Spring. Um, this is a, a view down low of it. You can also do a half mile hike to get up above it and to get a view that way, which I think is the way to do it. It's mostly a flat hike. The last little bit does go uphill. I have a steep climb to get to the top for this view. A couple of pictures of that. This is Grand Geyser. So you have Old Faithful, and Old Faithful is one of only five uh, predictable geysers in the park. Grand Geyser is the tallest predictable geyser in the world. It'll go about 200 feet in the air. But I think right now it's only going about every four hours, and that's plus or minus 90 minutes. You have Castle Geyser, which um, – I don't remember on this one. It seems like it's every seven or eight hours plus or five minus 45 minutes. Um, that's castle, another predictable geyser. Um, any time of year is a, a great time to see the lower falls. Uh, this is the grand Canyon Yellowstone, but it's a, there's a magic hour. I want to say it's around nine 30, depending on when you visit that you'll get the rainbow at the base of it. So not a great view of that, but you'll get a nice rainbow at the base there the bison so end of july into august this is if you don't go to yellowstone for any other reason in july and august if you want to stay out go for the bison rut go in the morning before the people they're the most vocal most active you see the most behavior that time of year from them and so this one is, is groaning or moaning or whatever you want to call it it's um vocalizing and this is what you get during that time of year these two 2000 pound animals that are just all muscle they they can run 35 miles per hour jump six vertical feet and they go head to head and these bison sometimes succumb to these energy and in, uh, injuries during this time um I, get, I think i have more on the bison here uh, if not you know it's well i'll talk about more of the behavior that kind of goes with all of the animals here moose are still in uh velvet and elk are at this time as well but the very end of august the elk start to go get out of velvet that happens typically in august where it doesn't happen until september for the moose the mountain goats um typically to see mountain goats you're going to baronet peak and looking a mile or so off and you can find them out on this cliff side but if you watch in July and August, um, in the, the Golden Gate area, Golden Gate of Yellowstone, as you go down towards Mammoth, right at Golden Gate, you have these mountain goats. Usually it's a nanny and kid. Sometimes there's two nannies and a kid actually go down into the canyon there, and it's a very great place. Is that same nanny, the kid was up higher somewhere. Uh, the best place to see mountain goats in the park is when they're through that area. This is going back down to Jackson, and this isn't until, you know, a month later from those first ones, and this was in July. And so I don't know if it was just late for them. They weren't successful the first time or what happened. But then compare that to 
July, this is Harriman State Park last year, two weeks later than what this date was, uh, going into mid to late um, July. So uh, swans are growing up. Um, some are, of course, still small. That was down in Jackson. Uh, down at in Yellowstone, you can find swans most commonly along the Yellowstone River. Not a great population of swans. Um, they were nesting at Swan Lake Flats this year. They weren't successful. Um, but every year on the um, Yellowstone River, they're releasing four or five swans to try to boost the population and get these swans to come back and nest in these areas. Um, at the end of August, you start to get the bears on the berries down in Grand Teton National Park. This is actually Grizzly Bear 399 and going for those berries. Um, so really the, the major berry down there, there's huckleberries they go after. The big one is the black hawthorn berries, which I'll get more into that in just a second. I'm trying to make sure I get through a lot of this. This is the last section, September, October. Um, the bison rut is over and you can tell she's, she was ready for it to be over kind of relaxed. So as that was a, a funny picture there, she looks miserable. Uh, again, the, the lower falls of the Yellowstone things start to quiet down there. You have the Harlequin duck. So September, they were, the, the females are still around at the Hardy Rapids. Um, moose have gone out of velvet and they start to go into the rut during this time. Uh, the elk go into rut as well. A couple behaviors I want to mention with the bighorn sheep, moose, elk, these ungulates. Is this here? This is the Fleming response. So they're raising those nostrils. They basically have this organ, the Jacobson organ, and they're sensing the pheromones from the females is the basic idea of what's happening here. You see them curl the upper lip and kind of boost their, their mouth up. That's what's going on. Um, with the moose specifically, you know, there might be, you know, uh, a bull and a few cows hanging around. And this is, this is what's happening. He approaches back behind her, starts rubbing her. Um, he's, he's sniffing and he's going to place his head on her back, letting know that he's ready and waiting for her, her to be ready. And so that's some behavior there um, before he would mount her. Um, the bison, not as quite there, kind of a little bit more, I guess you could say, aggressive and chasing um the elk you know each one's different bison might have you know two three four females that he's trying to keep track of at a time uh, a moose you know maybe five or six in the area um elk 20 30 females that he is he'll be servicing um this is all in grand teton if you want to see moose in grand teton um Go to the Grovant campground in that area in September to October. I mean, there are tons of them back there. It's where all the big bulls hang out. Um, and not necessarily right at the campground. Some of them are, are in the campground. You want to give people their space, but on either side or go, sh you know, hike back behind the campground. And these, these moose hang out there. And, you know, after they're done running around in the morning, they'll cross the river and hang out, then come back in the afternoon or, evenings um black bears and grizzly bears start going to high elevations to go after the white bark pine um, a great place and to see black bears and grizzlies better for black bears in the fall is going to be up on top of dunraven um, just watch for this tree swinging back and forth with a bear black bear on top of it um, bighorn sheep start blowing getting lower in elevation Start seeing them a few places in the views along the road. Elk are in the rut. Um, and they're, they're bugling. It's uh, September, uh, third week of September, elk are bugling and kind of at their, at their peak um, with their rut. Chasing the females, this is along the Madison. Madison, the uh, Mammoth Hot Springs around Yellowstone Lake, I think are some of the best places to see the rut activity. Winter starts to come. Coyotes get more active. Um, badgers are moving around down in, this is down in Grand Teton, and in the fall time along the Yule Hill Road up by Elk Ranch Flats is a great time to see badgers. 
as they're getting ready for hibernation. Steam starts to gather more on top of the hot springs. It's getting cooler out. Um, and the bears down in the Tetons are really at this time going after the berries. And you'll find them just right in the top of these black hawthorn berries, um, just gorging themselves. I've been on this road and seen 12 to 15 bears on that Moose Wilson road during that time of year. Um, they're not the only ones that go after the berries. You'll see a lot of birds. Um, in this case, this is, I believe this is a female tanager. There were some Orioles, there was Robins, uh, um, wax wings, different birds in the same area, you know, going after the fruit as well. Third week of September is also the um, peak colors for down in Grand Tetons, the best place for that. Yellowstone, you don't have as much colors going on. You know, typically we don't think of the rough grouse displaying in the September and October, but from what I understand, they're trying to keep their territory. And so this guy was displaying just off the lake there. And September, October is an awesome time to find great grays in Yellowstone. Again, I know owls are a sensitive species and typically I wouldn't share, but it's one of those that just drive along the road, along the lake, and you're going to see 20 people looking at nothing it appears to be. Watch for a great gray owl um, from Canyon down through Yellowstone, uh, the lake area, two or three places that are very, um, very common to see great gray owls during that time of year. And elk are starting to migrate. They're herding up into the, the big groups, starting to move out of the park. Um, wolves are, it's, it's a great time to see wolves as well, starting to travel together as a pack with their puppies. By this time, the puppies are traveling and getting ready to hunt with the pack. Um, bears are preparing. They're going into a state of hyperphagia, um, getting ready to hibernate. Um, it's an awesome time to see you know, September, October. Not as good as June and May to see bears, but it's neat to be able to see them in the snowy setting as it starts to snow. Um, May, or excuse me, uh, September, October is a great time to find moose. The best time to find moose in Yellowstone, basically up by Pebble Creek, far into Lamar Valley. And also in the wintertime, both in the Tetons and Yellowstone, which I mentioned, forgot to mention earlier, Yellowstone Pebble Creek in the wintertime is a great place to find moose and around the town of Kelly in the winter. I think this is the, one of the last ones. This is uh, October. It, a lot of these raptors still flying around. And in this case, it got a pipit. Um, and, you know, that was uh, quite a few kestrels were around. And also um, northern harriers were very active at that time. But I, I kind of, I did this kind of what time I think is best to see or see some of the animals in the park. Um, and I think this, this is recorded. And so take a second, take a picture of it with your, your phone or screenshot your computer if you want that, or watch the recording again. Um, and this last slide is my contact. So, sorry, the last bit I went through pretty fast. I'm very open to stay as long as you want. Any questions people have or this contact on here is if you're going to Yellowstone at any time and you want to know where to find a bear, an owl, a, a moose, anything, text me, email me, call me and say, I'm going to the park. Where to go? Um, you know, my business is called Tied to Nature, but my my kind of my catchphrase is for those that don't get out, can't get out or can never get enough. So my goal is just to share what I know. So, and what, you know, I keep, try to keep tabs of things. So if you ever have any questions or want to discuss more, please call me or email me or, you know, you can find me on Facebook or Instagram, anywhere like that as well. Would you show um, that next to the last slide that you did? Yeah. Thank you. And I could probably add more, but that was sort of some of the big ones I came up with right off. Well, I think we got another. Yeah. So, so I, you know, it's one of those things that I tried to, 
-hmm. pack all the information into a, an hour and a half or so that I, I usually have about eight hours on a tour to get more into a lot of that and the behavior and the animals. And um, so if you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out anyway. Adam, I, I really appreciate the way you laid that out. The, the animals by season and behavior. Uh, and I really appreciate your discretion about, uh, about um, locations and uh, protection of the wildlife. I just think that's really good. Thank you. I want to thank you. Well, thank you. Let me, did everybody get that one? One or two there. Yes, I hope I took a screenshot. I think I remembered how to do it. <laughs> and you know, I can I can send that out in the email as well. I can add a few things to it. Um, that was great, Adam. We really appreciate your doing that. Yeah, no problem. All right, that was so long. It was talking to myself all day. I was trying to narrow it down, but went a little longer than I I, I hoped for there. But. Uh, I hope you got some of that information. And again, you know, feel free to contact me anyway to, to, to get more. Thank you. It makes me want to get back to the park. I haven't been there for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. So. so Adam, um, this is Mark again. Uh, do you conduct tours in the park do i have that right i mean is that one of the things you do i mean you i do I, I i do tours in yellowstone so i have my own company um that's tied to nature and i offer tours in yellowstone and and what is the transportation how many how many people do you look for in a in a group so all i i just offer private tours and i'm hoping um changing th things up this summer right now i offer up to seven people I think by the time the summer starts, I'll probably have up to nine to 10 people, vehicle that will hold nine to 10 people. And my idea is, is that it's, I want it to be comfortable. I don't want to have a 14 passenger van. I want to make sure everybody has a window or a, a, a way to see. So I like the small private groups that uh, allows me to be more personable with people. And you'd write, would you run a snow coach in the winter? Do you have Yeah, a... I do snow coaches in the winter time, but I do that through um, a different company that has the permits for that. Okay. Um, typically Yellowstone Vacations. But you would, we could contact you w with regard to that. and You and... could, and, you know, I'd give you what information I know then to book anything directly in the winter time, you'd go through the company. Good. Excellent. That's really good, Adam. Adam, it's... Um... Some great shots you got. Thank you. Sorry for the glitch on the screen sharing at the beginning. I thought I, when you lost it, I thought I did something. Well, then I did did I did do something. <laughs> no, it's okay. That's no problem. We got it all figured out. And so we learn something every month on this. I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I learned to keep my hands away from the computer after things are moving. <laughs> And we've recorded this. I'm really not sure how you go about watching the recording later, but well, is, we'll no, we'll um, we'll it'll take Zoom a little while, a few days, to put this all together, and then they'll send me a an email with the link to uh, review this. So then I'll send it to you, Kit, and then you can put it out, and then. Um, That'll be available, not forever, but it'll be available for a few months anyway. Okay. Would that be, would that be something to put on the web page? Is that uh, or do, it would is that too much? No, I think we can do that. Well, then we could make a space for that on the web. Sure. Page. Yeah. If I get the link, I'll see if there's any way I can download it. And I have a YouTube page I can add it to YouTube, so it'll be out there that way too. Okay. Great. Um, All right. Okay. Well, if there's yeah. nobody else has any, anybody else have any questions they want to ask of Adam or anyone else before we end this? 
Okay. It's not. Don't all talk at once now. <laughs> Adam, thank you so much. It was no wonderful. problem. Thanks for inviting me to do that. Yeah, oh. we appreciate it. This is kind of between your wintertime tours and your summer, isn't it? It is. And so I'm actually out in the evenings looking for boreal owls now. Ooh, are you finding them? I hear them every year. I haven't found them yet. I yeah. don't do any calling, so I'm just listening for the calls and then trying to track into where they're at and not get sprayed by a skunk or eaten by a bear at the same time. Oh, yes, that um, would be good. That'd be yeah. advisable. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, if there's nothing else, I'm going to end this and cut everybody off, unless you okay. have. Hey, thanks, Don. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, thank you. Thank thanks you, Adam. a lot, Adam. That was great. Yep. Thanks, okay. everyone, for coming. It was real good. Thanks, Adam. You're welcome. Night, everybody. Night. Bye, Adam. Good night. Just end it.